Hi! <laughs> Welcome to this week's Learning Space. Uh, I see you guys have already started uh, using the Q&A as well as the comments on the event page. So welcome everybody uh, and happy Friday before a long weekend in the States from, from Nancy Graziano and I see there's some discussion going on about uh, various reasons why people in various countries may or may not have off on Monday. So happy Happy long weekend if you have it. Happy regular weekend if you if you don't. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, we are. So I am in a new location, just down the hall from where I usually am. Um, as you guys uh, heard on Wednesday, I've uh, temporarily taken over the resource center here. Uh, Colin Wilson, who was on, uh, which actually uh, Guido shared a link to the episode where Colin Wilson was on. Um, a little while ago. He is on family leave because he had a baby. So I'm running the Resource Center and so I can only really do hangouts when the Resource Center is closed. So hello from the Resource Center where I've now moved my computer to. Back there is uh, what used to be Tiny Interns Workstation. Um, I have with me Patrick Durrell from Youngstown State University. Hello. Hello. We're still waiting to see if John can join us. Uh, he is in Austin right now. Uh, so we've sent him the link to see if we hope he can he can join us as well. Uh, Georgia is at a conference in Lisbon, so I hope you're enjoying Portugal, Georgia. Uh, thank you everybody else for coming, even though we're at a different time. Uh, so we will have a fun conversation about Astronomy 101 teaching topics, and then at the top of the hour you guys can all switch over to the Weekly Space Hangout with Fraser Kane. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I wanted to bring you guys back. We'd been emailing back and forth for a while about teaching topics we wanted to do, but the problem is all of us were busy teaching over the last semester and didn't have as much time to, yes. to, to think about this hangout. <laughs> uh, and in fact, you're teaching a summer class now. I'm teaching um, a summer class right now. I just finished about an hour and a half ago. Which class are you teaching this summer? I'm teaching the Introductory Astronomy course, the, nice. so the Astro 101. Yay! So all, an entire se a semester of astronomy in six weeks, so it's uh, pretty high octane. Yeah, about two and a quarter hours a class and three times a week. So yeah, a lot of information in any given class. <laughs> so a lot going on. Yep. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I wanted to talk to you partly selfishly because I will be starting a new job as a professor in the fall and I have a teaching my own astronomy 101 class for the first time. Uh, so we wanted to talk about um, some topics related to teaching astronomy 101. Um, things that you would use in the classroom, things that, uh, cool demos, uh, ways of dealing with classroom issues. Um, is there anything you want, I don't know where you want to get started. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, it's always a hard place because there's just so many different things to, to, yeah. to consider. But I mean, I mean, certainly for me, uh, you know, I'm one of these people, I'm one of these people who wanted to be an astronomer when I was, you know, very, very, very young. And so I always had an appreciation at, at some level of wanting to be able to convey that to people. And certainly I'm sure a lot of people out there can appreciate, you know, maybe you've had a university class or even a high school class where you just kind of went, you know, this lecture is a little boring. Maybe, it, you know, if I do teach, I don't want to be that. <laughs> so, you know, my, my thing has always been, you know, to try to be at least somewhat animated uh, but, you know, main thing is to teach teach the way you want to teach, uh, be able to enjoy it, because I think the students really kind of feed off of that. Yeah. And and the reason we focus uh, a lot of our, um, our educational resources in astronomy towards Astronomy 101 uh, is that that is a very popular class, um, and often the last science class that many, many people will ever take in their lives. Like they'll take right. astronomy as their science elective or their science requirement because, hey, stars sound like fun. Uh, and so astronomy 101 can, can, can be pretty big, can be pretty big lectures, even at the tiny, tiny liberal arts school that I went to for undergrad, um, the biggest class uh, had about 120 people maybe. That was our biggest class, um, was astronomy 101. Um, so how do you, keep that audience in mind uh, when you approach how you're going to teach that class. Well, we can have classes up to our planetarium holds about 150 people when it's when the class is full. So, um, well, for me, it, it all comes down to the enthusiasm. And because I mean, one of the things, you know, people these days, of course, there's a big thing about 
oh, uh, what about online courses and all these sorts of things? The idea of an astronomy course is, as you say, it's the, it's the for many people, it's perhaps one, the only, if not one of the only science courses they'll take at a university. Right. And they're going to go out and do other things, and we want them to have an appreciation for what science is. And just as importantly, who does science? You know, the people who make science happen. So as an Astro One instructor, you're kind of there showing people, you know, not, not just, you know, the scientific method, but all the cool things that people can do. And you want to convey that through your interest and your enthusiasm. And, uh, you know, that's one of the things. The, inst the Astronomy 101 instructor, you're there to import your enthusiasm, your excitement to the science to those students. Yeah. So it really becomes your class. I mean, regardless of what book you use or whose notes you use, at the end of the day, it's your class and, you know, your personality is going to go into that. And if you ha even have a desire to put some of that personality into it, it uh, I always tell people, you're halfway there. You have to care what you're speaking about, show them that what you're excited about the stuff. And, uh, and, that, and that's, I, I would say that's half the game. Cool. Um, first of all, I have lights going off because the motion sensors in this room, whatever. Uh, <laughs> quick technical issue. Uh, Nancy pointed out that Patrick's video is not showing. It's showing for me. I just toggled it off and on. So you can comment again and let me know if the oh. video is working. If not, I may have you refresh on your end because it wasn't hiding properly and I just opened up control panel and toggled it. In fact, I'll toggle it again. Uh, so hopefully it's working again. So if you guys can comment back in the Q&A and let me know if that's working. Oh, um, okay. So. Oh, I screwed something up. That's probably my bad. Um, uh, no, well, like I said, I'm trying this for the first time on with a new webcam here, so. Well, it worked. I mean, it worked right off the bat, so. Okay. <laughs> it wasn't hiding properly when I went to, to put up the logo. Okay. It was possible okay. that I screwed it up. Oh, sure. Now people see what I actually look like. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> rather than just this crazy voice. This, this, this Disembodied voice. voice. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. I'm half in the dark because the motion sensor is yeah. Yeah. by where I'm sitting. <laughs> Yeah, it's gonna be a fun week. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, all sorts of also things are going to happen, and uh, that's just the nature of the business. And that's one of the things you're gonna to have to look forward to yourself when you start. I mean, just, yeah. you know, things are gonna pop up, and you know, all sorts of interesting things can happen. But uh, Astro 101 is fun. I mean, it, it really is. I mean, I, you know, uh, through my through different positions, I, I now have uh, 15 years of teaching Astro 101, and. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I still thoroughly enjoy it because, you know, people ask questions. They really, you know, some people really want to know the stuff, you know, whether it's the constellations. Uh, I always ask people my first day of class to write down, you know, okay, you know, for many of you, this is, you, you, some of you come in here with an expectation of an astronomy course. I'd like you to write down on a card what subject or subjects drew you to this course. So I could actually find out from the people on the first day. I look through the cards and find out, Oh, well, some people say, well, I just want to learn about astronomy. And some people say, well, I heard about black holes yeah. or I want to know about the constellations or I, I, I heard about, you know, the different kinds of stars. I'd like to hear about that. So you can actually get a feel from your students on the first day. Oh, yeah, you want to learn about all these things. And then the next day you can tell them, well, you know, half of you likely said black holes. I said, I can't teach an astronomy class without talking about black holes. So, you know, you're in luck. Okay. Um, That's a good idea. You know, things like that. I had somebody email me already for next semester asking what, um, with some questions and asking what I was going to cover, and I'm like, I haven't even decided what of all the amazing things in astronomy uh, exactly I was going to cover, but uh, one of his questions was primarily about um, how much math and physics. Uh, he's like, I, I didn't see prerequisite listed, I, I never taken calculus and physics, is this going to work for me? Um, and actually, uh, sorry, just got another comment. They're still not seeing you. Do you mind leaving and coming back to the broadcast real quick? See if okay. that resets it. Okay. How do I do that? Um, I think if you just hang up and then use that link I emailed to come back in. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Sorry about that, guys. Like I said, that's probably my bad because uh, it wasn't working the hide broad broadcast but didn't look like it was working from my end so I can see him in his office and you guys can't and that sucks so we're gonna uh, work on that when he comes back in um, <clears throat> but yeah uh, like I was saying I, I got uh, an email from students uh, already who are pretty excited about the class uh, and, and asking what um, 
what kind of prerequisites they might need. Hello, you're back. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. okay. Um, so they'll maybe they'll let us know again if they can see you. Um, so so how do you deal with? Um, do you uh, expect a certain amount of physics or math? knowledge? Do you use math in your, in your Astronomy 101 course? I know that's kind of a big debate, uh, how much math. That's always a big debate, yeah, because, yeah, it's definitely true. I mean, when some students, you know, taking a course like that, that's one of their first concerns, how much math. And when you say the word math, some pe people, you know, their spinal cords de decalcify. Yeah. Um, but, uh, no, our course is actually described as descriptive astronomy, and I don't do a lot of math and physics, per se. I mean, I I do tell people that, look, math is the language of, of science and the language of astronomy, but certainly no calculus. I mean, you tell them right off the bat, you're not going to have calculus. And when I teach it, no trigonometry either. The, I'll show them a couple of equations and then I'll sort of talk about how we use them, but I don't give them long problems. So I don't treat it as if, you know, give them the gravity equation and say, well, let's solve this like you would a first year physics course. Okay. Okay. So I have a little bit of math, but I always tell people, there's not going to be so much math that you won't enjoy the course. Okay. You know, um, that's one of the things. But no, there's no prerequisites for it. You know, the main prerequisite is simply, do you have an interest? It's for people of all backgrounds. So whether you're in general education or you're in criminal justice or art and photography, it doesn't matter. The idea is for them all to see Good. the basic ground groundwork of what astronomy is all about. So no, I would say a person like that, no, it shouldn't be much of a problem. I mean, you will see a little bit of math. Mm -hmm. I mean, I talk about Kepler's laws, a little bit of math, P squared equals A cubed. Um, I do show people the gravity equation um, just to show people, okay, don't worry about what the G is. Ignore what the G is. I put a little frowny face instead of a G, you know, but you know, what happens if, you know, I, I go as far as saying, well, what happens if you double the mass? What happens if you half the radius? So just to show people that right. we can figure out that if you make, pull two things further apart, gravity, the force of gravity gets weaker. Right, yeah, that kind That's of quantitative kind of reasoning that is do. the kind of thing. Mainly it's hey, guys. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hey, hey John. Thanks. Hi, you still have hair. Oh. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> well, well, he's kind funny. of had a hell of a Everything's just going to go crazy today. Uh, uh. So welcome, John. We're currently live, uh, and Pat, everyone can see you now. So yay! Yay! yay. <laughs> and the phone's ringing, and I'm just having a great old time. I'm I'm waving my arms to make the uh, motion detectors see to keep the lights on. It's just it's just a uh, crazy show. Yes, hands, you know. <laughs> so John. Welcome. We were just talking about um, Astronomy 101 and, and what kind of people take the course and, and particularly about how much uh, math uh, we do or do not use um, when, when teaching the course. Uh, so I was wondering if you wanted to chime in with anything uh, along those lines. Sure. Am I late, guys? If so, I'm very sorry. That's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, I have shame. Sorry, okay. I thought I we had we shifted an hour. Okay, I, yeah, um, I I didn't realize you were in Central Time Zone too, so I think we just had all kinds of time zone fail. <laughs> okay, so I have to talk twice as much now. Okay, <laughs> um, so uh, my my feeling about Astro 101 in math um, is I think that we want Astro 101 students to be able to do mathematical reasoning, and we want them to do like basic calculations, but I don't really think algebra is is a thing. Okay. Um, so, I mean, that that's my opinion. I know there are other people. Um, uh, there's a really nice person, Kate Follett, who's been working a lot on uh, math, you know, bringing more math into Astronomy 101, and she makes some, some compelling arguments. So if you want to sort of hear the other side, Google Kate Follett. It's F-O-L-L-E-T-T-E. Um, because they do some really nice stuff uh, about bringing more numeracy to Astro 101. But I think for most students, uh, like if we can get them to understand a simple graph and um, you know understand a relationship that you know you know things like the HR diagram or the way luminosity and temperature and size go together, those are the sorts of things 
I think would be helpful. Okay. So um, that's my opinion. Um, Pat, did you? What did you say? Did, did I steal your thunder? No, 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 no. Okay. No, I said basically the same thing. We talked a little bit, of, a little bit of math because I think it's important for students to be to realize that, you know. It, science isn't, you know, we're just not hand wavy things. You know, we want them to understand that at least there's some exactness to it, there's some precision to it, but not in so much detail that it bogs them down into the, into the details. Because uh, you want them to understand, you know, part of the goal, of course, is what do scientists do? Yeah. Uh, right. You know, you know, we know more than gravity. Just saying, you know, they get closer, they get, you know, the force of gravity gets stronger and so forth. You want to, you want them to at least have seen, if not experienced fully, but you want them to at least seen that you know, we apply such things uh, in a course like that, especially in an astronomy course where basically, you know, when you're, the person who wrote in saying, what topics do you cover, it's like, well, the short answer is as much as possible, but one of the hardest parts, one of the hardest parts in Astronomy 101 is picking what things you're not going to talk about. Yeah, I would that second that. That's exceptionally difficult thing, especially if you're doing it all in one semester. I mean, there's lots of topics that I go, well, if I have time, I'll add this, but most of the time I usually don't. So, you know, there are things that I really wish I could talk more about. And oh, that's absolutely. one of the hardest yeah. decisions you're going to make. There's been talk, so currently it's a one semester course, uh, and yep. they haven't offered it in a while, actually. I'm kind of bringing it back. Um, and they're talking about, well, because, you know, if it goes well and there's demand, we'll make Astronomy 102, and then you could have the two semesters. So that would give. Um, when I was at University of Virginia, they had, you know, 121 and 124, whatever they call them. One was like history of astronomy and solar system and planets and all that, and the other half yep. was like stars and galaxies and everything else, and that's typically how they split it. You didn't have to take one before the other, um, but you, you, you want people to get interesting content, but you don't want to overwhelm them. You don't want to overwhelm them, no. Yeah, yeah. So, so what kind of things do you do you think? What 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 are the must haves for for an astronomy course? Whew. Or are there Ooh. any? Uh, oh yeah. boy, that's a well, load. Well, okay, I, I'll I'll take this one because poor Pat has had to cover for me for half an hour. <laughs> so the first thing I think you should do, actually, and I do this the first day, and I know Pat does it the first day, is ask the students what they want to learn about. Yeah. Right, yeah, I mean, and you're. You're going to get the big three, which are some con combination of uh, constellations, black holes, why you hate Pluto. <laughs> right? Yep. You know, and, and, and then a kind of a smattering of other stuff, right? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. By the time I start teaching, we're going to have pictures of Pluto from New Horizons. I just realized that. Yes. You, you should so work that into your class, right? I mean, yes. I mean, you know, so you should be prepared. Like, the second the pictures come on the website, you put them in your PowerPoint, right? Oh, you yeah. Do that. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, I, make, I make half a lecture just on, okay, you're all going to hear in all the gory detail why Pluto got demoted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and why yeah. I don't care. I think yeah. I did it last night. Yeah. I had a star party, outreach star party last night, and I went off of it on Pluto again. Like, you don't hear Sirius complaining. It was demoted first. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, Sirius, always a bridesmaid and never a bride. Um, yeah. So, I mean, so I, I think that's the first thing. I mean, some things that I teach, and I think Pat, Pat and I differ, right? So this is actually a good question, is, you know, we, do, we both do a lot of uh, naked eye astronomy because... Uh, we have a planetarium, so it would be dumb not to take advantage of that. But we also have a lot of ed majors that will teach this in kindergarten and elementary school. So we do a lot of moon phases and seasons where other astronomy professors may not spend so much time on them. Like, I spend probably about three weeks on that kind of stuff. Or some people, like, it's a class. Mm -hmm. um, I spend a lot of time on dark matter and dark energy because I think if you, we don't talk about the biggest, two of the biggest puzzles in 21st century astronomy, we have failed. Um, I, I spend a decent amount of time on, on stellar evolution. Now I know, like Pat has made different choices. For example, I happen to know that I do a lot less about the solar system than Pat. So Pat, stand up for the solar system. Do it, Pat. You know you want to say why. Why? Yeah, why why do more solar system? Why do more solar system? Because well, the students have some familiarity with it when they come into this class, and they have a little familiarity, so you know they might see some old friends, if you will, when they uh, when they see that. 
but I've, I've had to cut back on that. I mean, it, it, going with the idea that, you know, at some point you look at your notes and go, okay, I don't want to talk about that as much, and I, you want to add something in. And it's really, like I said, uh, once you get into the, through the enthusiasm and the interest of meat topics, you do want to talk about the hard part is what to cut. I mean, I spend, I think I spend more than anybody I know talking about telescopes, because I'm a telescope geek. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll talk about all the different kinds of telescopes. I'll show pictures of where I've been. Uh, some of the, um, you know, full dome images of Mauna Kea. Those are awesome. Available on CosmoQuest. Yeah. Um, I'm going to put that in the showcase link, you guys. Product, product placement. Um, product placement. You know, but, you know, so, it, it, but, but again, the differences that there are between Astro 101 instructors has, again, a lot to do with the instructor doing it. I mean, you impart your interest, what you want to see. I think the students like to see what their instructor does. Um, I agree with that. So completely. I would expect, I mean, if I have to put anything on you, uh, Nicole, mm -hmm. uh, it's that students are going to want to see you in action. Okay. Got some pictures of you at Green Bank? Oh, my God. So, uh, Show yeah. Show them. I, you've been following Show the them what you do. Hashtag. Show them you working with the telescopes. Yeah, yeah, the girls yes. with toys hashtag. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah, girls Which, with toys. We were all over this weekend. Yeah, uh, yeah, but no, yeah. That yeah. kind of stuff. I mean, I've had students at the beginning. They don't. They don't think of telescopes as something they want to hear about. At the, at the end, I also ask them on the final exam, what topics interested you? And some people are like, Yeah, I like to hear about the telescopes and how you actually use them and what you actually do. So it's not just stuff out of a book. It's my instructor, as John would say, my instructor's got game. You know. I do this stuff. It's fun. It, and uh, you put that personal side of it into it. Again, this is the kind of thing you can't get from just going to a book or an online class or something like that. And I, 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 I personally think that's an important part of it. So, uh, I, so I've already said it's part of what you're going to be teaching, Nicole. <laughs> cool. Yeah, yeah I'm going to ask if you guys work your, your, your research and outside of classroom work into the classroom. Yeah, I mean, I definitely do. I don't do. I do a decent amount of telescopes, not not as much as Pat. Um, I do spend. I say I'm going to spend ten minutes talking about my research, guys. And uh, I say the reward for this is there'll be a very easy exam question, and if you just stay halfway awake, you will get this exam question right. And I talk a little about the stuff that I do. I mean, I I, I don't spend more than about ten minutes on it, but I think it's really important because. They need to see that, yeah, you're a working astronomer, mm -hmm. that, that you're somebody who does stuff with these telescopes. I think it gives you extra credibility. It, it does show you've got game. Um, I usually say, I've got game. I don't have ultimate game, but, you know. <laughs> um, and I think that, that they see that astronomy is this active human thing that people do and that you are not really just reciting out of a book. Right. And enthusiasm goes a long way, right? And you're going to be enthusiastic about your own science. Oh, yeah. Or you should be, or what's wrong with you. Or, yeah, you must hate your life. I, I don't <laughs> think there's going to be any problems there. <laughs> me and enthusiasm? I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, we have a question from uh, Tom Nathy. Um, do you do observing projects with students? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, uh, the answer in our case is not really in our on our lecture class. We do have a lab class where they do observations. In our particular case, we both teach in Northeast Ohio, which is kind of not a great observing site. Period. Um, so it's tough. Yeah. I, if we, I think if we taught, I know if we taught at a different location that was more rural or was more clear, I would emphasize that more. We kind of do more planetarium stuff because we do have this planetarium and because we have this nice infrastructure set around it. I mean, if we had infinite time and infinite resources, I would definitely uh, add more observing projects. Yeah. Um, Pat, you want to add on to that? No, I, you know, I wish we I wish we had more options to do that. But uh, you know, since we have a setup, and again, uh, different universities have different setups. Mm -hmm. You know, we have the lecture course, and then we have the separate lab course. So you can have that where the students are required to look for some constellations on their own, look at the moon phases, you know, uh, make observations through a telescope and things like that. But our, our lecture course, no. 
I mean, it, it is a hard thing because, uh, I mean, uh, Nicole, you brought up, you know, some places do. I mean, I originally started teaching in courses where you had two semesters where you could do lots of different things. But you will find that one semester to teach all of astronomy is, you know, you know, more difficult than it might seem. Uh, there's a, like I said, there's going to be a lot of things that uh, that you don't have time for. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to find that, and you sometimes you're going to go, "Oh darn, I wish I could teach more about blah." And I still say that 15 years in. <laughs> but I will throw in one I don't teach. Yeah. Magnitudes. <laughs> I used to teach magnitudes. I, I, <laughs> I do photometry for a living, but I don't teach magnitudes in my introductory astronomy class. So mag more. magnitudes are, for those of you who are who are not uh, familiar, lucky you, uh, yeah. magnitudes are the way we traditionally talk about the brightness of stars. Um, the system is logarithmic in the way that our eyes are logarithmic, and the numbers, because they were ranked from 1 to 6, from brightest being one and the dimmest being six by who was it? Was it Herodotus? Was it? It was Hipparchus. Hipparchus. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, it's backwards because lower numbers are brighter. So this can cause confusion when you're teaching magnitudes. And when you talk to astronomers who, uh, you know, used to working with optical data all the time, magnitude can easily to them. Um, and to your students, they may not necessarily. Do so. So, that's, you exactly, guys... that's exactly my point. I use I'm I'm an optical lean, as one of my colleagues a long time ago called me, and I use magnitudes all the time, mm -hmm. but I just can't bring them into the classroom. And amateur astronomers use them all the time too. I mean, that part of the parlance. So if they go and if they just do astronomy as a hobby, they're going to come across them. Right. John, what do you right. what do you do? You use magnitudes or teach? Magnitudes? Well. This is an interesting thing. In the beginning, I did do magnitudes. Mm -hmm. I thought, you know, I'm an observer. We should teach them about how to measure. My argument was we want them to really understand how stars, how we know stars' luminosities, right? Right. That Because I was building up to the HR diagram because they should know the HR diagram. In fact, I don't think there's an Astro 101 instructor that doesn't teach the HR diagram. Yeah, that's right. So I was like... How do we know that this diagram is real and not crazy? And I thought, oh, you should start with the observables, mm -hmm. you know, what you actually see in the sky, which is where the star is, its color, and how bright it looks to your eye, and how do you get that? Now, I went that way for about four years, and bit by bit, two groups of people gradually told me I was crazy about this. Uh, Pat, you know, you know, as, as a group of people, yes. As, as well, and and actually, my students. I mean, one of the things that I've been very fortunate is not only do I have students taking the class that are great, we often have student assistants that work with us in our interactive classroom. So there were students who took my class before and then came back as assistants, mm -hmm. and several of them kind of like staged an intervention and said, "Dr. Feldmeyer." They just don't get it, and, and they're not really learning anything from this class where you're telling them why absolute magnitude is measured at 10 parsecs and not 1 parsec. It, it, and they were right, at least and I, I was convinced, and I really realized a more interesting thing to talk about is how do we know the distance to stars, right, and focusing more kind of on parallax. Yes. So I sort of swapped out talking about... Um, uh, magnitudes and focused a lot more on parallax, and I think that was the right decision. Okay. Now, it's one of those things. If you want to get a bunch of astronomy 101 instructors riled up, yeah, that asking about magnitudes is certainly one of them. Yeah. So I, I, I sort of started one way, and I've gone the other way now. And I know I'm biased because I worked in Janskys. I'm radio person, and so well, don't even yeah, I that. always had that talk with my <laughs> yeah. fellow students. You know? Yeah. Please, please don't introduce Janskis yeah. as the oh, I Astro 101. Oh. Or brightness temperature. Ooh. Yeah. 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 Don't, don't do it. Don't do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, that's, but that's the thing. Like I said, it's, it's, it's but it, the thing is, is you know, I, I mean, obviously I picked the one topic where I know that, you know, I have definitely said I don't teach that. But again, each person is very, very different. Yeah. I'm sure if I cut down talking about telescopes a little bit, I could throw in some other things. Yeah. Uh, do a do perhaps a more thorough job on dark matter, like what John does. You know, it, but it varies from the instructor to the instructor, and that's the way it should be. 
Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, I, I think actually a really important thing for any teacher, but especially Astro 101, because you are overloaded, you just really have to choose, is you have to set, you know, what is it you want your students to know? And I, I always just use the analogy, like 10 years from now, Nicole, your students, you know, have left college, they've begun their lives or, you know, continued their lives. What do you want them to remember from your Astro 101 class? And I'm pretty sure it's not Jansky's. <laughs> Right. right or magnitudes, but you might say, "Hey, you want them to know that stars go through a cycle of creation, and then they die in interesting ways, and some blow up, and some become black holes." I mean, it, you know, whatever. Everybody's instructor's list is different, but I think you kind of need to have a list. Yeah. Right. You know, at least I mean, I would write it down on a piece of paper, and and refer to it often to make sure that you're hitting the stuff that you want to hit. Yeah. And and it really should be one piece of paper. If it's more than one piece of paper, you're in trouble. <laughs> you just can't teach 300 things. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I can voice that on astronomy majors over multiple semesters. Yes, you have multiple opportunities to torture them. Yes. So that's good. Yep. I'm looking forward to that as well. So. <laughs> Um, we have a question from Guido, who's in Germany. Um, a general question, because I'm unfamiliar with universities, is Astronomy 101 a standardized course, or does every college have their own version? I want to point out that not only does every university have its own course, every professor within every university has their own course. Yeah. Um, there's no standardization across the board. There's no standard no. curriculum. No. There, I mean, John mentioned there are some topics that I think most Astronomy 101 professors would agree should be taught, but it's going to be different from person to person and even within our university. I mean, other than all of our instructors, we have four sections a semester in, at our university, and sometimes we could have three or four people teaching it. They'll use the same textbook, but whether they use it a lot or a little, mm -hmm. it's really up to the individual person to do that. And because Astro 101 usually, usually is not a prerequisite for anything else, that gives you a certain freedom that your colleagues in, let's say, an introductory physics class don't have. Right. You know. I'll be teaching those too. Huh? Yeah. Well, you see, there that's different. There, you know, like a the physics course, you need to. There are certain topics you need to cover because then they need to take the second part of that course. And they need that the certain topics had to have been covered in the first one. Right. Whereas in astronomy 101, you have a bit more freedom in that. Look, you know, if I don't feel like talking about quasars, it's okay. You don't have that pressure. Yeah, yeah. I know. Before the AGN people out there start throwing things at me, uh, I did teach about quasars this last semester, so there. Karma restored. Um, but, yeah, uh, I'd just like to say my first astronomy paper was on radio observations of a quasar, and I don't teach AGN. Oh, that makes and sense. My first paper was on looking for quasars on photographic plates. Right, so... So, well, but see, here's the great thing, right, Nicole? If you want to teach quasars, teach quasars, right? I mean, there, there's a lot of interesting stuff in there. It's it's not. That's the problem. Is it's 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 like having it's like being on a lifeboat with all of your children and trying to throw one of them overboard, <laughs> right? It's it, it's it's not that I I would love I teach I do research on galaxy clusters and I barely mention them yeah, in, in my class yeah. because honestly I you know. Although it's cool to talk about George Abel and Abel clusters, um, and you know the man was a genius, um, really they need to know a lot more about dark matter, mm -hmm. in my opinion. But that's the great thing, right? Do, you know, um, one one other thing I guess I'd add is uh, this class is very popular in the United States. I don't know if it's true in other countries. It'd be interesting to know in Germany, but. The estimates are like over a quarter of a million students take Astro 101 every year. Wow. Right? And so it, one thing you can sort of be happy or terrified about is that that means you have an enormous possible impact. I mean, I've taught like over 3,500 students in eight years, and I know Pat is probably into the 10K, the 10,000 limit by now. And so you can, you can really feel like you're making a difference. Yeah. So that's nice. That's cool. Oh, that makes me happy. <laughs> um, and, and, and speaking back to that every professor having their own thing, um, I, when I, again, when I was a grad student at University of Virginia, I was a, t I was a tutor for the um, athletics department. 
and so I had I was for a while I was the only astronomy tutor, so I had <laughs> students from every section of astronomy. So I got to see secondhand at least how every professor in my department treated astronomy or 101 or 121, whatever it was called at the time, um, and the different ways of teaching. And, and like you said at the beginning, Pat, there are some that are boring. Um, there are some that actively turn students off of astronomy. Uh, and, but for the most part, um, they were awesome. But you know, they had different, different focus, different strengths. And so I got to see their teaching through the notes my students would bring to the tutoring session. Um, and the stories that they would bring. So yeah, even within one department, with the same textbook, wildly different courses. Well, um, I've, I've talked with people who hadn't taught before because because um, um, I actually did some teaching even when I was a postdoc, which is rather you know kind of a rarity. Um, but the thing is, is you know, they, they, people are always worried. Well, how do you teach your first class? You know, there's a lot of apprehension. But it, you know, really, you're more than halfway there if you you know you love the science. You want to make your course interesting, and, and you have at the back of your head, you do not want this to be boring. Uh, so if you heard or had boring instructors or heard of them, you know, through uh, students or through TAs, you know, you are, you know, if you already, if you have an interest and desire not to do that, you're more than halfway there. That's why I said, you know, once you get going, you know, when you have to get into a groove, especially when you're creating your notes for the first time. That takes a lot of time and to get things right, but you're always going to keep changing it. My lectures now are different than they were 10 years ago. And that's not just for the students sake, that's for my sake too. You know, it's um, like I said, I think you're going to have a, once you get going, once you get going, you're going to have a harder time deciding what to throw out mm -hmm. than a lot of this other stuff. Um, and, and we have a question uh, about another topic. Uh, Adam Synergy is asking, do you teach about exoplanets and how they are found? Um, and then, actually, it's two things. First, do you teach about exoplanets and how they are found? Also, do you have your students follow a particular solar system exploration mission? So these are two kind of hot topics. One is you know, <laughs> the robots we've got all over the solar system sending back news all the time, and the other one is, is exoplanets. So I definitely teach exoplanets. Yeah. I mean, that would also be on my list of don't yeah. remove. Because it is one of, the, one of the biggest things in astronomy in the last 20 years is that we now find planets so often around other stars that they don't even get news stories anymore, right? I mean, it's kind of remarkable. Um, so the idea of following a particular mission would be really interesting if you could time it right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that, you know... Um, it's tricky because you never, you know, missions blow up and hit the ground and things. Um, so, but I think the, I, there are a number of people that, that tie their Astro 101 classes to, like, current events in astronomy. And, and like, having people follow a mission would be a really awesome theme. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to be careful because it might not, uh, you know, there's certain missions that are easier to lock into than others. Yeah. You know, like... Um, What's the, there's the one Jupiter mission that's going to study um, the magnetic fields of Jupiter, right? Uh, I can't remember its name. Juno? Juno, right? Yeah. I mean, that's a really interesting astrophysical mission. That would involve you having to explain the dynamo theory of the magnetic field of Jupiter. Right. And although it's extremely exciting from a planetary science perspective, and I'm actually, like, I, I took Mike Brown's course online, so now I can actually say things about this um, to my students. Yeah, yeah, steal from good, smart people. That's it's okay to do that in teaching. Um, I know to understand why this is so exciting, but magnetic fields I would not do as a as an astro one on one topic. Mm -hmm. Beyond oh, you know, magnetic fields are interesting. Yeah. I, I think that's too much of a cognitive load. Mm -hmm. But again, uh, the basic idea of like following a current event, I did when the new Cosmos came out, I, I kind of hyped it because I thought, you know, this is going to be amazing. And I tried to weave that into my summer. I was teaching in the summer when it was out. I, I certainly weave that in and out of my class. Yeah. Yeah. I, one of the things, unfortunately, the timing won't work out for me, but it might work out for John. I mean, in the fall, I mean, we're part of a project to use the Hubble Space Telescope to get data uh, on a spiral galaxy M101. And one of the things I always thought about doing would be to once we get the data and show it to the students in class saying, here's some raw data off the telescope. This is how we do it. And then just put little snippets in here or there 
not maybe in an entire class, but little snippets here or there on how it's going, what we're doing, interesting. you know, what kind of insanity do we go through to uh, to play with data from the Hubble Space Telescope. So, you know, again, another way of showing them that, you know, astronomy, it's not just... It's not just uh, you know stuff from 400 years ago when Galileo pointed his telescope to the heavens, but what stuff is happening now? Right. Yeah. I mean, I wish my summer class. I wish I wish New Horizons was going by on June 14th and not in July. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, I would love to be able to say, okay, it's almost there. Here's some new images, and then next day saying, oh, you know, here's some even better stuff, and here's some initial results. You know, that would be kind of cool. It's just the timing, as John mentioned. Is, uh, is a key thing when you're doing that, especially a flyby like New Horizons, which is yeah, absolutely yeah. Whereas Siri, with series, we're going to be getting you know, or pictures from orbit for a while. So you could yeah, but the mysterious white spots, for example, that's something like first thing your students are going to ask you about that anyway, so you better have an answer. <laughs> um, and you, you know, um, but that's a that's one of those easily accessible mysteries. Huh? We did not expect there would be these little white spots on Ceres. What are they? Are they ice? Are they something else, right? And you can talk about you could talk about resolution, right? Mm-hmm. You know, oh, we're far away, so the cameras don't have a lot of resolution. As we go to zoom in, oh, look, they're not just two spots; they're multiple spots. Um, you know, th- you could you can if you're clever, you can work in what you want to work in. Yeah. So I, mean, I think it's been a very successful strategy. Yeah, I actually had a couple of students last semester say, yeah, I heard about these white spots. You're an astronomer. What do you think they are? <laughs> I've been getting those questions from family for a long enough time that yeah. I realized, a bunch of us in grad school all kind of realized, like, our families are going to keep asking us this stuff. We should probably pay attention to, yeah. like, the news. And, yeah. you know, that's why, I mean, that's why I started checking out Universe Today or, or Bill Plate's blog, because it's like, they're on top of that. I'll see what they've had to say about it. Yeah, well, it. That's, <laughs> well, that's kind of a, that's an important thing. That, yeah. It really is an important thing, because sometimes, you know, uh, if I've had a busy week, I don't, I, I don't see all the news releases. Right. And sometimes I'll have students come to me and say, I just saw this news article on TV about this, and I know you just talked about this, and I'm trying to understand what's going on. It's like, have you heard about this? I'll go, nope. Nope. Hum a few bars. Let's see. Let's talk. You know, uh, and stuff like that. So you know, it's good to get the feedback from the students. You know, what what are they hearing about? Yeah. You know, we'll read Universe today and see what the latest stuff is going on. But you know, what are the students hearing? Is 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 actually interesting to me. I think you I know, offered that as extra credit uh, when I taught back in grad school. Is bringing an article and talk, bringing an article about a recent topic, and I think because it was life beyond mm-hmm. Earth, it was astrobiology mm-hmm. related, and talk about it, and they extra credit yeah. just for talking about it. They didn't have to do it right, get it right or wrong or anything. Yeah, well, but, but that's another thing about astronomy. Astronomy is constantly changing, mm-hmm. and it's something we try and get across. And again, it's not just, you know, the instructor, you know, doing stuff, but it's also, you know, look, here's some things that are changing. Here's a new result. Two days ago, we didn't know about this. Now we do. What do we do with this? Yeah. So they can see science real time. And again, again, it gets away from the static idea of, oh, I'll just read this in a textbook. Okay, and this kind of this kind of continues to break that mold, and I think I think that's a key thing. Yeah. So, so you talked about the G word. Have you guys talked about grades and assessment at all? I'm not. Okay. The G word. I, yeah, let's 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 talk about the G word. At the end that. of every semester that I've taught, I've pretty much ranted about grades to someone somewhere, mm-hmm. and have right. it, it yep. still takes away from the point. Uh, so yeah, go ahead and and talk a little bit how you. Well. How you uh, yeah, so it's it's hard, right? Because um, you have to do two things simultaneously. You have to keep people excited about astronomy, but in the end, they know and you know that there will be a grade assigned for their work. And so it's worth thinking a little bit about like, whatever kind of class you want, whatever kind of social structure you want to build in your class, if you want um, participation, Students do pay attention to grades, and you know, I'm not the first or the last person to say this. Um, I learned about this from uh, the woman Sheila Tobias, who writes a lot of uh, books about science education and feminism and stuff. But there's the hidden curriculum, which is your students look at your syllabus and they figure out what they need to do to get the grade they want in their class. And although that means that the teacher has to think really carefully about what they're including is their grade. If something is important to you, it should have a 
grade tied to it, as, as awful as that sounds, because that's a way for the students to say, I think this is important. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you spend half an hour talking about Pluto, but there's no question about Pluto on your exam, you kind of failed. Mm -hmm. Because you kind of have, it, it's sort of deceptive. You, you, I think this is really exciting. I'm spending half an hour of 42 hours, and there's nothing about it. Mm -hmm. Right, so there's that kind of thing. Is that you're, you're whatever you're doing to grade, whether it's exams or something else, better link up very closely, like like this, with your teaching. Okay. The other thing is, I'm sure Pat talked about this, is that you know we both have a participatory style in our class, but the problem with that is that means the students have to show up, mm -hmm. right? And so, for example, if you put your notes online, some students will think oh, all I have to do is study the notes and I can get an A in the class. And you have to do something to sort of like, no, this is really important that you show up and that you participate and that that's not an optional part of this class. And I know this is really boring and like your numbers of people are like dropping by the second, but you want people, you want to reward the kind of stuff you want to see in your class. Mm -hmm. You want to reward the kind of learning you know, that you have in your class. I mean, if you could have a brilliant lecture, but if you ask a really dumb question on your exam, mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, name the moons of uh, Jupiter, which actually I've heard is on like a teaching thing for high school teachers. Like, do they really need to know that it's Ganymede, Io, Callisto, right? Do they really need that? No. Yeah. Yeah. On the other hand, there's a question that Pat and I both ask, right, that we have a bet about every semester. How many stars are there in the solar system? My, my professors do that in undergrad too. Yeah, right. What, what kind of percentages do you get? Well, in the beginning, uh, when I first started at, at our university, like 60% of my students were getting it wrong. Uh -huh. And I would go to a wall and bang my head against it. Yeah. And now I do like a rant, and I tell them that there's a competition between uh, Pat and myself about who, who gets the lowest. But is it wrong. is it? Is it not having the knowledge, or is it just misreading the question? They, no, they have a cognitive disconnect between solar system and galaxy. It's actually trickier than you think, right? right it's, yeah. Is that when they see a solar system, they see a blob in the middle and a disk. Yeah. And the Milky Way is a blob in the middle and a disk. Right. And, right. If, and, and you see it in news articles, right? But this is something that Pat and I... You know, continually, you know, try to one up each other on, which is actually a good technique, right? But um, they have real problems. People have a cognitive disconnect between a solar system being a much smaller thing right. and the galaxy being a much bigger thing. Right. So, but you know, it's actually a tricky. Even though it sounds like a simple question, cognitively, it's quite tricky for yeah. our students. And so I do talk about it, and I warn them: this will be on the exam. <laughs> right. You better get it right. <laughs> Um, yeah, they don't know I, what form the question will be in, though. But that's true, right? But you know, so remember, students will pay attention to your system, mm -hmm. right? Whatever your system is, um, you know, and so you have to kind of think very thoughtfully about what you want, whatever that is. I mean, you might say, I, for example, um, I want students to actually read the book. I actually believe that books are. I, I, I'm not. They only get learning from a book, but that if I'm going to make them buy this textbook that costs eighty dollars, I want them to crack it open and read it. And so, a small amount of my grade comes from reading assignments, not a big part of it. That's but I think if I didn't do that, most of the students would not crack open the book yeah. because yeah. students are always juggling different things from all of their classes, plus family commitments, plus work, and. It's kind of important that your grades kind of tie up with what you think is important, whatever it is. No, that's a good reason to think about it too. Is they have to prioritize it with the rest of their life. And I have some students that are, yeah, parents and work full time and in school. Like yes, they have to prioritize. Right. And, and yeah, absolutely. Here. A lot of people have second jobs and stuff like that here, and yeah, they have to, you know, be able to put it all together. And yeah. Oh yes. So I'm sorry, that was a really boring. I apologize to the internet. No, <laughs> no. But Nicole funny. needs it. Well, and actually, I wanted to ask you about a bit the participatory aspect of it. How do you get students to participate in the class? How do you make it active in some way? So I would say um, that the most important things is, one, you do it the first day. Mm -hmm. you, you, you must have activities the first day. 
you must model those activities and you must explain why we're doing this. Mm -hmm. You don't have to show them you know, articles from astronomy education articles that show that, but you can say, look, I mean the analogy I use is, look, you watched your parents drive for years and then you learned to drive. You know, this is a good analogy for most college students it's because they still remember this. And I said, when did you learn more, watching your parents drive for 14 years or driving yourself? Mm -hmm. And I'll say, driving yourself. And I say, right, so we're going to participate. It'll make the class more interesting to you. You'll learn more, and you'll be less bored. I, I, I think if you're, if whatever kind of participation activities you do, we, we both do a lot of participation in our classes. Um, you do it the first day, and you make it a habit, and you also show them how it's connected to ultimately their grade. Okay. Right? Like, this multiple choice question on think, fair, share is a lot like this question on my exam. Right, right. Right? And, yeah. and then they go, oh, so participating in class will help me with my grade? I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, Pat, what did you want to add on to that? What, what did I miss? Oh, nothing. It's just, but it is, yeah, it is important to keep doing it. And, uh, and something that we found over time is that, you know, especially for people who are teaching Astro 1 for the first time, it's like participate may not work well that first time, but you have to keep working at it. You're no different than the students in that regard. Okay? You're going to learn things that don't work. I once in a while sit back and go, I don't think that lecture on gravity really worked. You know? I mean, I was given a lecture using a blackboard, and I go up and I go, uh, yeah, and by the you know, I talk about gravity, and I said, and then all things with mass have gravity. And I turned from the blackboard, looked at my class, and their jaws looked like they'd hit the floor. And I said, and I went to myself, and I went, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> so you're going to constantly be learning and adjusting. Uh, like I said, you know, the same kind of behavior that you're going to expect from your students, you're going to be seeing yourself. So if at first you don't succeed, you know, keep trying the active learning stuff because it is very good stuff, and yes, it keeps them engaged. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I totally agree with what Pat just said. The only thing I would add on to it is, and this is a trick I heard from multiple smart teachers, and I think it, it works for just about anybody teaching, is I have like a little notebook that's just about notes about my class, mm -hmm. where I like learn from my mistakes, okay. right? Yeah. Like, that, that analogy did not work at all. I should really not do that, or or hey, that worked really well, or that worked well in my noon class, but not in my one p.m. class. Why is that? Um, and and it doesn't have to be a long thing. I usually write like a, maybe a paragraph or less. But what happens is you have these little realizations, and then next semester you forget about them. Yeah. And then you'll remember them right after you make exactly the same mistake. Oh, that's what I've done. Right? And you're like, yeah, yeah, right. So I uh, and so I now write them down and we've and been here before. before. Right? Is is you know, just like when you do your science, it's like a scientific method thing. Who who would have known, right? Um, is is you 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 know, it's important to say, right, the first time you teach anything, it's usually kind of tough sledding because you haven't taught it before. If you but if you learn from your mistakes or the things you would like to do better next time as well as the things that go well. Like, if something goes well, write down, this went really well. I'm going to use that joke again, right? <laughs> you, know, um, you know, I'm very happy with my Pluto section, for example, now. I'm very, you know, like, this is a good lecture. I like it. Yeah, just um, wait till July to change it all. Yeah, that's totally true. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but, you, you, you know, you learn, you can go through the cycle, and you, you will get better very quickly. Cool, cool. Well, my student, my future students at St. A's, thank you guys for all the awesome advice because <laughs> hopefully they will benefit. <laughs> I hope so. I think they will. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're going to do a good yeah. job. I, I have no doubts. Yeah. Enthusiasm plus some preparation. Enthusiasm plus some preparation. <laughs> and, and I think a lot of this is, is, is helpful for any other instructors out there. High school teachers, I know there's more astronomy being worked into the curriculum um, for, for a lot of states in, in the U.S., particularly in the next generation science standards. You guys have space science! Um, so I think that'll, that'll be helpful for, for a lot of people. So uh, thank you guys for all the awesome conversation. 
Um, I do want to wrap up because I know our audience is going to yep. run over to the Weekly Space Hangout next. Uh, yep. As they can, should, actually. They, they should. Thank you because for the questions. Awesome stuff. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys for all your questions, your comments. Um, thank you, John and Pat, uh, for the great discussion. And, uh, yeah, so thank you guys. And we'll be back with Learning Space. Uh, I think Georgia will be back for the next one. We've got... Uh, two more episodes coming up in June. Um, right now, uh, we are going to be the, uh, I've scheduled for June 3rd. We're going to be talking a little bit about the Intel International Science Fair that I went to last week um, and talk some about that. You guys some information on if you ever wanted to get your students interested in that as well as some of the amazing astronomy projects I saw because I didn't understand to the other projects I saw. <laughs> but the astronomy ones I understood. Um, and then I think we're going um, to talk a, lo a little bit about uh, life in the universe, astrobiology type activities um, from a uh, summer camp I'll be running in the beginning of June. Uh, so we'll, we'll demo some of those activities. So that's what we have coming up in June. Um, thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you guys for joining us and being awesome. And <laughs> I'm sure I will be bugging you uh, privately a lot more <laughs> as Please I really get into Good this luck work. in August. Thank you. Yeah, you, you're going to do awesome, yeah. but send us emails anyway. <laughs> I will. I'll be like, ah, ah I'm saying help. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone, for watching Learning Space. We'll see you next time.